This is Dr. Shakani from Learn Piezo, and today we'll be discussing the basic concept of driving a piezoelectric slash ultrasonic device. So there's two fundamental concepts that I want to be, start off highlighting. The first is you need to think about your piezoelectric and an ultrasonic device as a capacitor. Um, I think commonly we do understand that oscillators, uh, you know, have off resonance behave like capacitors, but this specific uh, property is going to be very important in the discussion to come. Secondly, you need to understand piezoelectric properties and their behavior as a result of change, as a result of changing uh, your electric field or your stress. Oftentimes we represent equations in physics Oftentimes, you represent equations in physics as in linear format, like what you would learn in high school or middle school. But in reality, they exist most uh, perfectly defined in a differential form. So this differential form will be extremely important for understanding our uh, piezoelectric and, and how to drive and, and what the what the mechanism and fundamental. Uh, driving factors are when you're designing your circuit um, to come with a a good understanding uh, from, from, from a fundamental approach. So we'll go on with that. So I mentioned two uh, phenomenon. Uh, the first are two, two things to keep in mind. The first you're going to need to treat your piezo like a capacitor. And the second is you have to understand that the properties, the behavior of piezoelectric devices are determined by the delta, which is by determined by change, uh, not simply by amplitude. And in this case, since we're talking about driving with an electrical circuit, we're going to be describing things in terms of charge or coulombs. So we'll begin now by discussing a basic circuit we have a voltage source you can call it a battery and it'll have a output resistance followed by our piezo which will which will be describing as a capacitor and what fundamentally happens when you come uh, when you connect the circuit uh, let's say the voltage source is at 5 volts well then you will get 5 volts of um, voltage drawn over this capacitor and then as we you, you kind of will understand well the strain if you depict that as lowercase x is determined by the PL's electric constant so let's call it d33 in the three direction from an electric field um, and you may have your material expanding you know getting longer or getting wider depending on which direction your polarization was in. So plus one, depending on the direction of your spontaneous polarization, you'll get different, uh, uh, you'll get either the material expanding or contracting in uh, along the uh, polarization direction. So this is a simple case, you've, you've loaded it. But what happens if we now cut this circuit? So these two points right here are we we cut the circuit from there. And now we no longer have a completed circuit. Now what do you expect happens to your piezo? And, and assume we applied uh, you know assume this is our piezo here. And we applied uh and this is our spontaneous polarization direction going downward. Uh, in the sense this is positive and negative. Uh, so we have a our material expanding in that direction and contracting and contracting in the perpendicular direction and expanding in the parallel parallel direction, right? Uh, if we have this, now we have disconnected the circuit. Uh, what happens? Well, if we now look at the charge which was then which was stored and which was transferred it actually maintains the electric field across the material and you kind of have your piezo that you stretched 
it'll continue to exist in that direction and in that condition. Because now if you think that, okay, let me, you know, let me reconnect the piezo back. You know, let's just go around this connection here and let me connect it back. What happens? Uh, what happens is nothing happens. No thing. No thing. Nothing. Nothing happens when you connect it back. Because the charge already existed. The charge which flowed, you know, originally onto the material uh, to create uh, the electric field to, to charge that capacitor, it didn't leave. Uh, you know, I'll repeat that the charge never left, so by reattaching the battery, you're not ex re expanding the material or causing more expansion. And by unhooking it, once all of the charge was uh, dumped onto your capacitor, onto your piezo, you no longer uh, need it. You no longer need that external source to provide the uh, divide the charge, which is then going to develop the electric field across the material. So, going forward, now let's think if we want to use our uh, piezo in an AC kind of condition. So we want to we want to apply we want our piezo to vibrate. We want it to be ultrasonic, or it could be subsonic, depending on your application and whatever is of interest. So now we have, we replace our voltage source with a sinusoidal source. And again, we'll have a um, resistor. And we'll draw our piezo again as a capacitor. It's the simplest format. An interesting thing to think about, it, uh, when you're looking at the piezo, you, know, you notice I'm drawing it with two straight lines. We're not drawing our piezo with a polarity with the described polarity you know with, with the curved line and a straight line and we do actually it kind of reminds me in, in fact that applying an electric field you know if it's against the polarization direction you know we have positive and negative and uh, if you apply an electric field opposite to the polarization direction you will induce nonlinear effects at certain electric field levels. Uh, this is definitely true. However, despite that, since the, since, you know, you, that's kind of the region of the material you try to avoid. And you know, if you try to start to get in that region, uh, you have kind of more nonlinearity. So that's something you're going to be accounting for. But, but you typically these devices, you know, in this case are biased when you have to operate with a large electric field, you do typically bias your piezo such that you don't run into negative voltage, uh, uh, which will then act against the polarization direction and provide a, a, a sort of a depoling field on your material. But nonetheless, you know, we, uh, this is just basically saying we always tend to model it and describe it with straight lines showing it's sort of a linear thing. Whereas it's sort of not, but but uh, we don't take it that far. So let's complete this circuit here. And yeah, you could just draw the ground symbol. Uh, just like we could have drawn it on the previous one. We drew a negative. We could just, just throw it on the ground here. Alright, so here, one might think originally that... We can throw in a switch, or we better yet, we could actually have. We could actually put instead of the uh, AC source, you know, because AC sources are going to come from somewhere, right? We can have an a we can have a DC source, you know. Let's keep that five volts on there, and let's now just for for fun, let's continue to assume it's fifty ohms. I'm not going to describe what the capacitance is for this. Let's just say it's like one microfarad, which is actually very high. Usually your capacitance for your piezos are in the nanofarad range. When you have a multi-layer capacitor, then you get to the, your microfarads. Uh, but uh, just for argument's sake, let's say this is one microfarad. And this 
switch right here is controlled by an AC source with a certain frequency. Uh, whose units are in hertz. Now, if we're going to be describing this case, what well, you know, what's going to happen when we start when you right as soon as we power the circuit? Now, this is going to be an exaggerated view. Let's say the time constant of this 50 ohm resistor and the one microfarad. You know, honestly, it's so simple. You probably I probably ought to just calculate the thing. Yeah, so it's obviously you know just. 50 microseconds. And 50 microseconds. Um, and because that's 50 microseconds, that's going to be 20 kilohertz. So let's say we apply our AC waveform at 100 kilohertz. What's the output going to look like? So let's just draw um, let's just draw one time cycle. So let's assume this is fifty microseconds. And then therefore we're gonna have five cycles in there because we have hundred kilohertz. So one, two, three, four. Yeah, whatever. Uh, and let's say it's it's this is a, this is driven by a square wave type of thing where you have a square wave, you have on, off and uh, this distance is um is 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 one cycle so we'll have when the circuit is closed we'll have an increase in voltage and then it'll drop down right will it drop down once it once it opens so let's say it closes for this part Will it drop down? No. It'll be flat. And then when you close it again, it'll start to climb up again, and it'll be flat. And when you close it again, it'll start up. So this is, this is a, if you zoom in here on, on that area, we have this first portion where it's closed. And then here you have the open part. That, if you're measuring the voltage right here, that will be the voltage there. Now, if you look at the voltage here, it'll always be constant, right? Because it has something to do with the switch. But see, as we kind of like, as we start to keep climbing up, and eventually, you know, this is the one. This is one time constant, so it's not going to get completely uh, saturated there. But eventually, you'll hit that five volts, and you will have your your piezo. Um, at that point, it's it's that's not you know it's not going to get any uh, larger by uh, or or the charge is not going to increase because if the charge is not going to increase. We're not going to have any difference in uh, size or elongation or or, or or strain. So, kind of recapping what we just talked about. In the first case, we showed. We showed that disconnecting the circuit disconnecting the circuit or basically the voltage source um, had no effect on uh, strain. So the strain was not affected by disconnecting the voltage source once you know once we have once uh, the piezo, is charged and the second point that we got is if we implement a switch we will get you know it has a certain frequency that we we program in there with the you know square wave kind of duty cycle um 50 percent duty cycle well we'll get um you know, slow saturation. Uh, 
And, and according to uh, that, that time constant, tau, which is the RC time constant of your piezo capacitor and your resistor uh, from your source. And this slowness is, yeah, it's dependent by the time constant, which actually could be quite fast. But again, you'll reach a saturation point, which is according to your voltage source. So now we can ask, so, okay, so we can't put a switch in line with our, uh, with our voltage source in order to create a, um, uh, you know, a vibration of our, you know, of our PA's electric element, this is a, a simple buzzer or acoustic pickup or however, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's not going to create a alternating or vi vibrating, uh, source. So, so how do we use a DC power source to drive a PA? So, and I'll just describe one of the methods uh, that you can come up with that simply. From, from the basic elemental perspective, you can talk about different amplifiers or op amps or driving it straight from a microcontroller. Um, we, I'll, I'll touch on that uh, actually, and, and it's going to come in, it's going to come into play here. But we are actually going to focus on a more simple approach, and that approach is the the one of delta charge. So let's let's go back to our original discussion. In our original discussion, slide number two uh, or so, we had our voltage source, and our voltage source had a resistance, and it had a capacitor attached to it, which is our piezo, which doesn't have, which is not demarcated with any polarity here. So we had a five volt source here, and if we got end up getting five volts on there, all as well. Then I we talked about cutting that five volt source. Now we have our piezo here, and our piezo has five volts. Now, if we are if we want to cause it, and, and let's say it, it created. You know, you started with a black pen, which is obviously not going to work. Uh, so we started with a with the piezo here, and let's say the electric field made it elongate to its new shape here. So after this elongation, um, if we then go ahead and use a gray marker and we attach it to ground, or it's not even actually important to even attach it to ground, we attach it to the other terminal. we're going to get our original shape back. All right. And then if we reattach it, let's say with the blue color, we reattach it, we are going to get our elong elongated shape. So in this way, by charging and discharging the capacitor, we're going to be introducing uh, and if you want to call it strain positive strain negative zero not negative oh not negative zero strain because we're because the the terminals or the electrodes are equally potential so zero strain positive strain zero strain or if we had flipped our piezo uh, and this is strain you know some some call it mu during my grad st studies, it was called del lowercase x. All right, whatever. Uh, but if you had that piezo upside down, we'll have this. We'll have negative strain and then back to zero. Um, if we somehow had another voltage source, so if we had another voltage source that we connected here. And we had coming down, and let's just say we put a resistor there just for fun. If you had another voltage source and you decided to connect it with a green pen, this power supply with here, so I'll just draw it in three colors now. Um, we'll use, we'll first erase what we, what we actually are not using. I 
I'll use the gray for here for this connection. I'll use a green if you took this terminal and you connected it here and we'll use a blue if you took this terminal and you connected it here um, so in the first case in the gray case and we'll draw a nice axis here so in the gray case we have let's say positive strain and in the green case we have zero strain because you connected the terminal so you're not going to have any strain and in the final case the blue case we have negative so this is essentially going to be you know depending on how you connect these you will get positive or, or, or negative uh, negative strain. So I want to actually go over one more thing here. And that is this. And this is going to be interesting here. Um, so if we have, again, our, our voltage source and we have our output resistor, we've charged our piezo capacitor, which has a decent D coefficient, uh, not all ceramic capacitors for electric capacitors have a decent uh, D33, uh, especially in cases where you're actually implementing a capacitor on a circuit which happens to be for electric for the you know the high frequency characteristics, the higher capacitance and the smaller form factor, multilayer, uh, etc. etc. Those are optimized for capacitance, they're not optimized for their piezoelectric uh, capabilities. Uh, so, uh, going forward, if you then develop the 5 volt source on there and you cut these connections, and I'm going to draw polarity, not polar true polarity, but just how you applied your, um, your actual electric field. So, I'll erase that, I'll erase this. So, now you have these wires hanging off. This is just your battery. And if you took this part and connected it here, and if you took this part and connected it here, I mean, what would happen in this case? Well, let's think about it. So the first step was where we actually applied positive voltage. And we, we specified positive voltage as well. Um, it leads to a, uh, let's, let's say, positive strain. So this is strain. But then we applied, then we unhooked it all. right? We, we unhooked it. And, I, and we mentioned that even if you unhook the material, you're still going to have the charge developed on the surface of the electrodes and be causing an electric field. Therefore, you'll keep your um, uh, values. Uh, you'll keep your strain. But now we reverse this. Well, what's going to happen? Well, this is going to become positive and this is going to become negative and charge will flow across these terminals in order to make, create that. So now you'll have a negative strain. And this negative strain will be associated with that negative 5 volts. This will be associated with the positive 5 volts. So this will be associated with your negative 5 volts. Um, the next thing we want to discuss here, going back to our AC um, circuit where we, where we started from a DC source. Well, this is not really an AC circuit. If you well, if you go back here uh, to this, we never really ended up with an AC sort of waveform. We kind of ended up with this jumpy thing, this sort of stair steps until we got to a saturation level. So we're going to end this discussion by talking about a method or perhaps the simplest, worst method, I think, to get an AC waveform to your piezo. Um, and I'll describe why it's the worst method. It's extremely inefficient in terms of power consumption. And let's assume that this was the 50 ohm 
let's say from the source, whatever. I don't think batteries have a 50 ohm. I, I would have to check uh, what uh, uh, what output resistance they have. Uh, but going forward, uh, we have our switch. But before I describe the switch being here, and that really didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because it didn't change the charge on the piezo. In order to change the charge on the piezo, you have to take the charge from one of the potentials, however you want to determine it, holes, electrons, you take the positive charge and you need to dump it back where the negative charge, where the negative terminal is to make them equipotential, therefore change the charge state, and when you change the charge state, the electric field uh, applied from that then also changes. Uh, therefore, we then have change in, uh, uh, change in the strain. But this will not provide that. So therefore, um, for a sort of electrical safety, we'll put in another resistor. Let's just call it one, 10 kilo ohms. Uh, then we will put a switch, but we'll put it here. And then we'll put our capacitor, our piezo capacitor. So now let's let's take a look at what's going to happen. And this has a uh, omega associated with it, and this is going to be a square wave pulse. Let's say an on off. So this is on. This is off. The bottom. Um, then let's assume it's much slower than you know much higher than the time constant uh the, the the period of the the frequency being driven we'll basically have a very quick time the piezo gets charged and then when this closes the piezo gets discharged and then it gets charged and it gets discharged so this is actually the measure of the of, of the um the charge on the piezo, but it's also going to be a measure of. Well, you could you could also just say it's um, cross that out and just say it's strain. Now all of a sudden, uh, you can also cross it on say it's that electric field or voltage or uh, which is which is going to be on your piezo because you're going to be increasing it and decreasing. So basically, you have to get this charge back to the other side. You have to make these potentials. Um, equal or change them in order for charge to flow so the flow of charge is very important in order to make the piezo actuator or piezo electric device ultrasonic device move make it tick you'll need to transfer charge and that's the again the basic value of approaching your piezo firstly when getting a fundamental idea of how it works understanding it as a capacitor, as a capacitor which develops charge and the charge state of the piezo then uh, then directly uh, relates to the strain and the electric field and, and the voltage. So this would be, I mentioned this is ineffective simply because we're, when this is closed, we're going to be dumping a lot of voltage here and the and and the time constant to charge this capacitor is going to be limited by this 50 ohm and 10 kilo ohm uh, resistor. Now there are other amplifier kind of mechanisms by which we can drive the piezo. There are inducting inductor values which are put in different spots uh, here. Uh, there, you could put a resistor here. There's many other types of uh, methods to drive your piezo. You can directly drive it using a controlled voltage source, like a microcontroller, or you know your the, your function generator, which is actually going to output that voltage. So we started from a DC source in all my examples, but really, if you start from an AC source and you directly hook that up to your capacitor, well. You know, your obviously your voltage. Uh, let's say it's a sinusoidal voltage. Your voltage is going up and down, and, and you could say so is your charge. I mean, your charge is your charge is going up and down too because that voltage state is changing. You know, let's say these are these are in phase here. 
Um, and you could say the same thing for your strain. So in that case, it's much more simple. Um, but and, and when you're driving with a microcontroller like an Arduino, you have you know you have a pulse train of voltage. Let's say you're turning it off, five volts, five volts, and this will be the same effect at, 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 of your piezoelectric at off resonance. And you know on resonance, we're going to be talking about that perhaps a little bit later. Uh, but for for our discussion here, understanding the piezo as a capacitor, understanding it in off resonance format, um, oftentimes it, even in off resonance, you'll need to uh, I mean you will need to drive devices and, and those uh, and, at those frequencies for bending, for example, bending actuators or multilayer actuators, which are not driven uh, typically at the resonance uh, frequency. This will be kind of an important discussion to understand your piezo as a capacitor, understanding the charge in your piezo being directly related to the strain, uh, not just the fact that whether it's connected to a voltage source or not. Uh, the idea that a change in charge, a depletion or a uh, connection to a voltage source which can supply the charge necessary in order to alter the state of the piezo, um, the state of the, the, the charges on the piezo uh, would drive the, uh, would drive the motion, would drive the, the actuator. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it very useful. Uh, this is a simple principle long video simple principle but extremely important uh going forward in your ultrasonic piezoelectric journey